Ja, 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 I'm Philip Hume, the secretary of the Mortimer History Society and author of On the Trail of the Mortimers uh, and currently writing a book on the history of the Marcher Lordships. Uh, today I'm talking about the 200 year struggle that the Mortimers engaged in to conquer and control the Welsh district of Mylineath uh, to the west of Wigmore. Because once established at Wigmore, the Mortimers soon took their opportunity to seize further lands in Wales, taking control of the district of Mylineath. Keeping hold of it though was a completely different matter and final control was not secured for nearly 200 years uh, and, the and the Edwardian conquest of Wales in 1282. And indeed, during this period, the Mortimers ruled in Malinieth for only about 80 or just over 80 years, chafing at the dominance of the Welsh princes in the area during the rest of the time. The talk gives an account of the dramatic events as power swung back and forth between the Mortimers and the Welsh princes, exploring the factors that made the conquest such an, a protracted affair, looking at the influence of the Welsh, uh, of the Welsh kings in South Wales uh, and in Gwynedd to the north, as well as the crucial role of the English crown in the process. Uh, I'll just start my talk with a quick apology. Uh, one or two people have been urgently coaching me in my Welsh pronunciation. <laughs> which, uh, as some of you who know me, my English pronunciation is not always that good. So I do struggle sometimes with Welsh pronunciation. Uh, thank you to those who have done that. And of course, uh, any mistakes are all my own. As you know, Ian has uh, described the origins of the family uh, and the uh, coming to England in the aftermath of the Norman Conquest. A huge focus of the family's efforts in the period following that was the conquest of the Welsh district of Mylineath, uh, just over the border from Wigmore. And that is now the focus of my talk. However, I'm going to start the talk by jumping ahead to this afternoon. And I hope in doing so, I'm not spoiling uh, the story for anybody, and I'm not giving away uh, anything. When I say that at the end of November, 1328, Roger Mortimer, at the height of his powers as the effective ruler of the country after the forced abdication of Edward II, was raised to the highest rank of nobility when he was created the Earl of March. <coughs> Ian, in The Greatest Traitor, describes how contemporaries were amazed and furious at that choice of title, encompassing as it did such a huge area, a whole region indeed, and potentially setting himself above all the worlds. However, whilst his enemies claim that this was another example of Roger in modern parlance getting above himself, the title it reflected that the Mortimer land, wealth and power were rooted in their domination of the Welsh marcher lordships. The 50 or so independent lordships that has developed as a territory that lay between England and Wales and that were administratively uh, not in either country. The Marcher Lordships ran from the North Wales coast, the deep, round the Dee estuary, down the English Welsh border, and all the way across South Wales to uh, modern day Pembrokeshire. And in each Lordship, the Lords exercised unique almost regal power. And the map uh, 
shows the lands which by the time of the early 14th century were the Mortimer's own inheritance, uh, which are the heavy block, and then the other lands that Roger Mortimer acquired in the Welsh marches. So given that the height of his power, Roger Mortimer chose such a controversial title, it is important to understand why the Welsh marches became so important to the family. And indeed, why the conquest of Malinieth, in particular, got under their skin and became ingrained in the psyche of the family. It's also a good story with plenty of murder, mayhem and marriage. To understand how that story unfolds, just need to very quickly remind ourselves about the context that the Normans came into uh, in 1066 in the aftermath of their conquest of England. Because the context in Wales then shaped how uh, the events developed over the following 200 years. First of all, as you're all familiar with, uh, Wales is a country of a diverse topography and, and, and geography, uh, with fertile areas around the coast, but a mountainous interior separated by valleys with fertile lower plains. That's a topography which means that there is no central focus. Communication links were poor, and which made it difficult to conquer, but also contributed to a country in which there were regional and tribal loyalties. They dominated. Although there was a sense of Welshness, the politics were based on regional and tribal loyalties. And so as a consequence, whereas other countries, particularly Anglo-Saxon England, were moving to a more united political and administrative structure, the process was slower in Wales, and there was still a fragmented political structure. In the aftermath of the departure of the Romans in the 5th century, a whole myriad of minor kingdoms had sprung up. Over the following centuries, they had gradually merged through marriage, through conquest, and so by the time of the mid-11th century, they, there were four main groupings, four main kingdoms, but their boundaries were fluid and changeable. So in many ways, it is better to regard them uh, as groupings of power and spheres of influence. Uh, so you, you have De Hebach in, in the south, Morgano in the southeast, Powys in the central area, uh, and Gwyneth to the north, although in this period Gwyneth had for a time taken over Powys. At various periods, powerful leaders had emerged <coughs> who, through their own, their own power, force of their personality, uh, through military might, had come to dominate the whole of the country. That had never been supported by unified administrative structures, and so on their death, the, fragmented, the country had fragmented again. The most powerful of those rulers was Griffith ap Llywelyn, who had died in 1063, so very, only just before the Norman Conquest, and very much in people's memories of a powerful ruler who had succeeded in uniting Wales. Uh, and so that very much influenced policy towards Wales. Another part of the, that contributed to the fragmentation was that in Wales there was a sy different system of inheritance. It's now generally acknowledged that whilst for the inheritance of land and wealth there was a, a part of what is called partible inheritance applied, so the division uh, of the inheritance equally between all sons, legitimate and illegitimate, and therefore leading to the uh, breakup of wealth and power. But, the, but there is now a, a view that there was a recognition that a kingdom was indivisible, that a kingdom was not uh, fragmented through inheritance in that way. However, the legitimate claimants to a kingdom were not just the dead king's sons, but also their uncles, their cousins, and their second cousins. 
resulting in frequent outbreaks of feuding and violence within the families to secure power. <coughs> so as a consequence of all that, there was almost constant war between kingdoms and war and feuding within families for supremacy. And so it's not surprising that in the 100 years before 1066, the chronicles record the deaths, the violent deaths, of 35 Welsh rulers and the naming of many more. And indeed, there is one, on one occasion, the chronicles record that a king died in his old age. And that is so unusual that the chronicles actually uh, record that, that he died in his old age, because that was the exception. And then the final point, just to quickly make, that again influences the Norman approach to Wales, is that although the, uh, in, king, the king, English, the Anglo-Saxon kingdom uh, in, in England had increasingly become a unified kingdom, very much as a consequence of the Viking invasions earlier, uh, which had wiped out some of the earlier Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, leaving the Kingdom of Wessex in a position to, once they had defeated the Vikings, to the kings of Wessex to assume uh, control over the whole of the country. Um, although that process had happened uh, to the east uh, of Offensdyke, those Anglo-Saxon kings, kings in England, had never attempted or desired a conquest of Wales. From the time of King Alfred, then the kings of England had sought an overlordship uh, of the kings within Wales, and that was what uh, their policy w was based upon. So they're the factors I just want you to bear in mind as we begin to look at the process of the Norman uh, encroachment into Wales and the Mortimer's 200-year <coughs> conquest of Mylineath and the reasons why it became such a contracted process. Because the whole, the situation that the Mortimers came into was one in which uh, it was Wales was a difficult country to conquer. The, the focus of the Mortimers' <coughs> attention was an area in the middle part of Wales which had by this time begun to assert an independence from the kingdoms that I mentioned before. Um, a kingdom or a grouping of power uh, known as Hrongguiahathran, which literally translates as the area between the Y and the Severn. Um, so you can see here the River Severn and the River Y, and Hrongguiahathran is the kingdom that is between the Y and the Severn, although at times there were areas uh, just outside that. And within Hrongguiahathran, uh, it was made up of the districts of Malianeth, Gwarthunian, Kumudefur, Elphile, Radna, I can manage, <laughs> Bilf, and Kerry. Wigmore, it, Wigmore is just here. So you can see that Malianeth is right immediately on the doorstep uh, of Wigmore, and clearly the area in which the Mortimers are going to have their eye for conquest into Wales and grabbing land in Wales. And you can also see the, the importance strategically of Malianeth and the whole of Rungwiahathra. Not only does it border England with fertile uh, lower lands at lower levels, but it's got the strategic <coughs> river valleys providing access uh, through into the heartland of Wales, through to the Welsh coast, and down into southwest Wales. So, an area of strategic importance, strategic for the Normans for access into Wales, but also strategically important within Wales as it was creating a buffer zone between the kingdoms of Gwynedd and Powys to, Powys to the north and Dehubeath to the south, uh, and so an area of strategic importance. <coughs> I, 
I won't talk about that because you probably can't see it very clearly. Uh, but that is the family tree of the princes of Hungria Hafen, uh, descended from an early 11th century prince, uh, Elfstan Glodrith, uh, and, and his descendants. Uh, but I'll be talking about, uh, during the talk, particularly uh, Madog, uh, Madog Ab Ibnuth and his son, and particularly his sons Maladith and Kadwashan. I'm going to now, in terms of beginning to talk about the Mortimer's incursions into Marinius uh, and, the con and their conquest in, in, into Wales, with this quote from the Brittany Toy, Toy Sogion, which I will refer to as the Chronicle of the Princes, which is the uh, translation and much easier for me to say. But in the Chronicle, it is recorded that in 1144, in that year, Hugh Fitzranulf repaired the castle of Camaran and a second time gained possession of Mylinius. And I, I have deliberately put the emphasis there on the second time, as that clearly indicates an earlier conquest. However, we have to piece together when that earlier conquest might have been from other events. Doomsday Book, in 1086, records that Ralph Mortimer uh, did hold land on the eastern edges, eastern edges of Malinith, uh, including Pillath. But we can't be certain as to whether the, the Mortimers holding those lands at the time of Doomsday resulted from early raiding uh, across the border because it could equally be lands that had been held by the Anglo-Saxons before, 10, before 1066, because it was a very porous border, and we know that there was Anglo-Saxon settlement well to the west of Offa's Dyke and, and in the areas around Radnorshire. So it may well have been that Pillath was an area occupied by the Anglo-Saxons and given at some point to the Mortimers, rather than land that they had conquered. Soon after the conquest of 1066, William the Conqueror, very much aware uh, of the power that had been exercised across Wales by Griffith ap Clywyn, had established three powerful earldoms along the Welsh border at Hereford, Shrewsbury and Chester. And not only did he give those earldoms to his most trusted followers, but he also granted them considerable powers to enable them to provide an, offensive, <coughs> an effective defensive barrier against Wales and with a license to encroach into Wales. Also at this time, following the death of Griffith at Llewellyn, the Welsh dynastic families and kingdoms had fallen into a particularly vicious period of feuding within families and between the kingdoms. And indeed, the first recorded Norman involvement in Wales was when the Normans are being recruited by the Welsh to fight on one side or another in the internal wars between the Welsh kingdoms. And during William the Conqueror's reign, encroachment into Wales happened to some extent uh, in the southeast, along the Severn Valley, and particularly along the North Welsh coast. The death of William the Conqueror in 1087 and the accession of William Rufus disrupted these arrangements uh, because the Conqueror had been working with local Welsh rulers. Uh, he had appointed Rhys Ab Tudor, uh, or he had come to an agreement with Rhys Ab Tudor uh, that he could hold his lands in South Wales. Those arrangements broke down on uh, the Conqueror's death uh, and with the uh, accession of William Rufus, uh, the Normans began to encroach further and further into Wales. And in 1093, Rhys ap was killed in a battle with the Normans. And the death of Rhys opened the floodgates and the Normans poured into central Wales, across the valleys towards the west coast and down into the southwest. 
And it is likely that it is part of that process that Ralph Mortimer took the opportunity to annex Malinieth uh, under the control of the Lordship of Wigmore and, built, and first built the castle at Camarum. Those normal advances, though, uh, could not be sustained and they were pushed back within a fairly quick period of time. We're not sure how that left Malienef. Um, probably uh, a mixture of Welsh control in the upland areas um, and um, Mortimer control uh, in the lowland areas to the east. As Ian has uh, demonstrated on a number of occasions, uh, the Mortimers at the turn of the century appear to have not been active uh, in England uh, and, and to have returned to their lands in Normandy. And so we, do, we have very little knowledge of what was happening uh, in Wigmore and in Malinief during this period. It was also a time when Henry I was establishing his own personal authority uh, and his dominance across Wales, partly through reminders of his military strength, but mainly through a forceful personality that established his overlordship of the Welsh princes. But towards the end of his reign, um, suffering from ill health and absent from the country in Normandy, resentment was beginning to simmer in Wales. There's indications that Camarum Castle may have been captured and burnt by the Welsh in 1134, but certainly Henry I's death in 1135 released the valve and resurgence erupted across Wales. And almost certainly Madog Abidnev reclaimed control of Mylinius for the Welsh in that period. And it is around that time when, having lost their control of Malinief, Hugh Mortimer returned, or came, uh, probably for the first time, came to England uh, to uh, take up the uh, control of the, of the Mortimer lands. And of course, he was coming to the country at a time not just of Welsh resurgence, but also at a time when civil war was beginning to break out in England the anarchy and the violence that was erupting uh, because of the competition for the throne between King Stephen and the Empress Matilda. Much of the anarchy was in this area because the bedrock uh, of the support for the Empress Matilda stemmed from Gloucester in the southwest and spreading up to the marches. But Hugh Mortimer remained loyal to the king uh, and Probably, almost certainly, Hugh Mortimer and a small group of barons who were loyal to Stephen met with King Stephen at Little Hereford, just up the road from here, twice at the end of 1139 uh, and early 1140. And Hugh Mortimer became the leader of the Royalist forces. But Wigmore itself was becoming increasingly isolated. The other barons in the area were switching their support and their allegiance to Matilda. And so going back to the quote before, uh, that in 1144, Hugh Mortimer regained possession of uh, Camarum Castle and took Malinia for the second time, then the, per the reason for doing so was not just a matter of family pride to regain lands that were lost, but also it was a strategic necessity to establish <coughs> lines of communication out of the beleaguered Wigmore uh, and to open up uh, th those lines of communication. Again, the Chronicle gives us glimpses of the violence that ensued over the following years. Two years later, uh, Marudith ap Madog ap ap Idnerth, the son of Madog, was slain by Hugh Mortimer. Madog himself had died in 1140. In 1142, two years later, his two eldest sons, Howell and Cadogan, were killed by the Lord of Clun. His third son, Meredith, is now killed by Hugh Mortimer. The fight for control of Malinius was becoming bitter and personal. But again, Hugh Mortimer's control of Malinius didn't last long. 
The distraction of the civil war in England, combined with the ineffective rule of King Stephen, meant that there was neither the resources nor the will to sustain a position in Wales. And probably by as early as the 1150s, Malienneth was back in the hands of the next surviving son of Madog, and this is where I am going to struggle. I do find the uh, double L, uh, so you have to put up with me. Cadwashan, uh, is that close enough, Emma? Cadwashan Af Madog. And unfortunately, he has a long life, and his sons are, he and his sons are prominent now in the history, and his name is going to keep on occurring. So you'll have to bear with me. Because Cavoshan and his sons hold Malienne for the next 40 years. The civil wars in England came to an end when Matilda's son, Henry II, acceded to the throne in 1154. And Henry came to the throne with a determination to re-establish the authority of the crown, both in England uh, and to establish his domination and his overlordship over the polity of Wales, over Welsh princes and Norman barons alike. However, with an empire that now stretched in unbroken territory from the border with Scotland down to the Pyrenees, and as his reign went on, with his own personal authority weakened from the breakdown of his relationship with Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, and Becket's eventual murder, and also by the rebellions of his own children, eager for their own power, Henry very clearly adopted a policy of coexistence with the native Welsh rulers. And Henry II recognised the Welsh princes as the local rulers of their kingdoms in Wales. And they, in return, gave homage to Henry as their overlord. And indeed, in the south of Wales, Rhys ap Griffith, the ruler of De Hebath, was in, was in fact appointed the King's Justicia of South Wales, becoming known as the Lord Rhys. So with the King recognising the native Welsh rulers, Hugh Mortimer was powerless to intervene in any decisive manner. His scope for action was very limited. Bismo didn't stop him from raiding when he could. In 1165, Hugh Mortimer was fined 500 marks by the king, and a year later a further 100 marks for refusing to return cattle that he had seized. And it's most likely that they were cattle and those fines were as a result of raiding into Mylineus. Now, if that is so, it is solitary that it was Hugh Mortimer who was punished by the king. And indeed, at a council summoned to deal with Welsh affairs in 1175 in Gloucester, Henry II again enforced that status quo, <laughs> confirming Welsh rule of Mylineus, with Cadwashan pledging 500 marks to the crown for recognition of his rights. And the following year, he was sufficiently secure in his rule to found the Cistercian Abbey uh, of Cumhia on the western edge of his lands. And indeed, when his brother, Aenian Cleet, was killed in 1177, Cadhoshan seized his brother's lands of El Thile, the neighbouring district. And with his enhanced power, one contemporary styled him King Cadhoshan. But again, he did not survive long to enjoy his success. In 1179, summoned to appear in the king's court to answer charges against him, Cadwashan was given a safe conduct to return back to Malinieff. But on his way, he was set upon and slain by the followers of Roger Mortimer, the son and heir of the now elderly Hugh Mortimer. But again, the Mortimers were punished. Roger Mortimer was imprisoned for two years for continuing the family feud in breach of the king's safe conduct, while some of his men were executed. So again, it is becoming a very bitter, very personal dispute uh, between the two families. 
Cadwallion was succeeded by his two sons, Maelgwyn and Howell, who ruled jointly for a period. And an event in 1188 demonstrates the almost normality of their control of, Mile of Mileniath. When the Archbishop of Canterbury and Gerald of Wales toured Wales to raise soldiers for the Crusades, they were welcomed in Malineath and hosted by Prince Mildwyn. Again, though, the ascendancy of the Welsh was going, came to an end during the 1190s. The death of Henry II in 1189 and the accession of Richard, II, of Richard I, Richard the Lionheart, led to another change in royal policy towards Wales. And at the same time, this combined with an outbreak of now infighting between the descendants of the Welsh princes uh, of Hrungwyar Hathren, but also conflict developing between the Welsh kingdoms. And indeed, Gerald of Wales comments that the borders of Wales sufficiently remember and abhor the great and enormous successes which from the ambitious usurpation of territory have risen amongst the brothers and relations in the districts of Malienleth, Elthire and Gwerfunium, situated between the River Wye and the River Severn. And so with the uh, new approach uh, of the Crown, which was encouraging further incursions, further expeditions into Wales, uh, and in a context of the uh, disputes between the Welsh kingdoms uh, and disputes within families, the Mortimers were able to take advantage of this. Um, and to, in the mid 1190s, were able to reconquer uh, Mileyeneth. Uh, and to annex it again uh, under, under their control. And certainly, by 1200, Roger Mortimer's control of Malienneth was complete, when in a charter to confirm the possessions of Abbey come here, and this is qu quite an unusual clause, he commended to God the souls of his family, which is standard, but then it adds, and in addition, he commended to God the souls of my men, the living, and those who died in the conquest of my lineage. A very strong indication that at the turn of the century, the Mortimers felt that finally, after 100 years of struggle, of strife, the conquest was finally achieved at that uh, momentous time at the turn of the century. However, we know that that was not to be. And there was another 80 odd years uh, to go uh, before the Mortimer control was finally secure. Very soon after 1200, there are indications um, that that Mortimer control uh, was beginning to be nibbled away at. As early as 12, 1202, they're beginning to lose uh, land on the edges of Malinieth, uh, the district of, of uh, Grafunian, being retaken by the Welsh. The start of the 13th century also saw two developments that increasingly impacted on the Welsh marches. First of all, the loss of all the Crown's lands in France during the reign of King John, which Ian commented on before, and that meant that for the first time Britain became the focus of their attention, having lost all the continental lands, then all they were left to play with was their lands in Britain. And at the same time, during the, as the 13th century developed, there was the rise to power of two remarkable princes of Gwynedd, who each extended their power across all of Wales. Initially, during the first part of the 13th century, uh, the descendants of uh, Cadwallion continued to pursue claims to Malinieth, but initially through the courts. Uh, Emma, later on this morning, will be talking about the increasing use of litigation in this period. 
Uh, and there's an example here where the Welsh princes begin to resort to the courts rather than the battlefield uh, to, to try to stake their claim to Malinius. Uh, but they, they get nowhere, and the Mortimers continue to hold Malinius. But things begin to break down. There is growing conflict in England and within the marches, a conflict between the de Bries family and King John, and the conflict that is developing between King John and the barons of England that leads to the Civil War uh, and, and lead to Magna Carta. And the Welsh are able to use uh, those circumstances uh, to regain control of Mylineth, Llewellyn uh, ab Yorwerth, uh, in alliance with the, the, the Brees family in 1215, uh, conquer Malinieth uh, and succeed in, in, in holding it. Uh, and they demolish uh, Kumaran Castle. And so Mortimer control is ended yet again and is ended for another period of 25 years during the whole lifetime of Llewellyn ab Yorwerth. And Llewellyn's conquest was formally acknowledged in 1218 by the Regency government of Henry III. And Llewellyn appointed the descendants of Cadwashan to administer the district <coughs> on his behalf. And with Llewellyn dominant across much of Wales, it was now the turn of Hugh Mortimer to resort to the courts to pursue his claim. It looks as though the courts ruled in his favour because in 1220, Llewellyn wrote to the Regency government to refuse to hand over the district uh, to uh, the Mortimers because he had done homage to the king for them. A week later, though, the Sheriff of Shropshire was ordered to transfer Marienif back to Hugh Mortimer. But when Llewellyn replied that if he had dared to do that, Llewellyn would resort to arms the matter was dropped. But local disputes continued, particularly over towns such as Knighton on the eastern edges of Marinia. That was resolved, when, as Emma, I think, will mention later, a daughter of Llewellyn, Gladys C, married uh, Ralph Mortimer, and Llewellyn gave Knighton to, to the Mortimers as part of uh, Gladys' dowry. But again, during the last 10 years of Llewellyn's life, he retained control of Marlinieth. And the truces of uh, the Middle and Brockton, both in 1234, confirmed Llewellyn's possession. But interestingly, they controlled, interestingly though, they confirmed Llewellyn's possession by conquest and not by right, clearly leaving the door open for reconquest, for reconquest by the Mortimers in the event of Llewellyn's death, which they were quick to exploit when that event happened in 1240. It's a, a very quick, quick comment. Those of you who are visiting Abbey come here know what a beautiful site it is. And if you have walked the length of the church, you will have realised it is an enormous church one of the largest in England and Wales at 242 feet long. Only Durham and Winchester are longer. For a long time it's been assumed that the church was built by Llewellyn and Yorwerth at the height of his power uh, uh, as Prince of Gwyneth and Lord across Wales. But more recently David Stevenson I think has argued quite convincingly that it was in fact Roger Mortimer who built the church uh, at Abbey Cumbria uh, during that period when the Mortimers were in control of Malinieth uh, between 1200 and 1215. Following the death of Clorellin, the Mortimers were very quick to, uh, to invade that into Malinieth um, and to reconquer. And Kumaran Castle, having been demolished now a number of times and been rebuilt, then the Mortimers built a new castle at, at uh, Kevin Cleath uh, on, on the ridge, the very prominent, dominant ridge there. And quite significantly, uh, the lords in the area uh, quick claimed all their claims in Malinieth and Guerfunian to the Mortimers. And significantly, 
one of the lords who did that was Llywelyn ab Gruffydd, the grandson of Llywelyn uh, ab Iorwerth, uh, and who of course was a cousin uh, of Roger Mortimer, both grandsons of Llywelyn ab Iorwerth. And so the despite the, the feuds and the fights now for Malinius are becoming quite bitter uh, within the family relationships. Because in 1246, Llewellyn ap inherited Gwynedd, and in the same year, his cousin Roger Mortimer inherited Wigmore uh, and control of Malinius. As Llewellyn ap uh, control of, of Gwyneth uh, became more secure. He gradually began to extend his power uh, further into Wales, first of all into northeast <coughs> Wales and then down through central Wales and into the south. First of all, seizing the territory of Gwerthronian uh, that he had quick claimed to the Mortimers back in 1241, and then in 1262, uh, supporters of, uh, of Clorin ap Griffith. Uh, seized the castle of, Ke of Kethan Leith. Roger Mortimer uh, went to uh, try to relieve it, uh, but then found himself uh, besieged within the castle. Uh, and whilst he was holed up in the castle, uh, the, fort, the armies of Clawellian went on a rampage around the area, sacking and destroying castles of Knighton, Nucleus, and Christine. And Roger Mortimer was forced to surrender and allowed. And allowed fairly humiliatingly, humiliatingly, to return back to Wigmore. And so Llewellyn ap Griffith was secure in his control of the whole area of Thrumgliar Hathren uh, and particularly Mylineath. And the Treaty of Montgomery uh, in 1267 uh, confirmed Llewellyn's role as Prince of Wales. And, but it, that treaty, though, stored up problems because of the ambiguity of some of the language. Um, one of the clauses stated that in the land of Malinius, the nobleman Roger Mortimer shall be allowed to erect or build a castle as he wishes, but let restitution of that castle and that land be made to Llewellyn if he claims a right therein and if it is adjudged to him. So, somewhat ambiguous. Roger can build a castle, but actually then the Chorin can claim it for himself uh, if, he, if he can show his own right to the land. And that ambiguity is then something that over uh, the next period uh, is contested in the courts. Uh, Roger Mortimer, in fact, rather than um, uh, re repairing the castle that had first been built, built himself a new castle at the other end of the ridge, much to Llewellyn Chagrin, uh, sparking off letters to the king uh, to, in, of complaint which, which were ignored. Gradually though, the Llewellyn's own position weakened uh, and his relationship with the new uh, king, King Edward I, uh, deteriorated and it, and it finally uh, resulted in outright war when Edward I uh, de determined on the final conquest of Wales in 1276-1277. And Roger Mortimer was one of the commanders leading one of Edward's three armies, and as part of that, Roger Mortimer completed the final conquest of Mylineus. And as his reward, he was given more marcher lordships, rewarded with the lordships of Kerry and Kedawine. As we know, uh, Llewellyn was, as a result of, uh, of that, was restricted to his own uh, territory in, in Gwynedd. Uh, but then further war broke out five years later, uh, when his brother Dathith rebelled and Llewellyn was forced to join in. Uh, and although the events of that rebellion didn't directly impact on Malinia, uh, as, as is well known, the well in met his end, led into a trap, uh, or certainly of which the Mortimer uh, brothers were part of, of that. However, yes, Emma, I am coming on to it. 
Uh, David Stevenson has convincing you. There is a question there, Emma. The second bullet point. David Stevenson has convincingly shown that although the Mortimers may have been part of that trap that, le that lured Chloe into his death, the Welsh of, uh, of Bilf and Marineth were totally complicit in that uh, because the Welsh of the area were demonstrating that they, in many ways, preferred uh, the lordship of the Mortimers, the, who, who were local, and preferred that to, their, to the foreigners of Gwynedd. Because going back to what I was saying before about the fragmentation of Wales, then for the people of Malinius, the people of Rongoir, Hathren, the foreigners were not necessarily the Normans, the foreigners were the princes of Gwynedd. Uh, and when the uh, Hawarin had been extorted money uh, to pay for uh, what he needed, then they sided with the Normans rather than with Hawarin. So the, the conquest of Malinius was finally complete. In that period from 1093 to 1277, um, a period of 184 years, then the, the Mortimer control of Malinius was probably only for about just over 80 years. But it had become ingrained into the psyche of the family, a bitter and very personal feud. But it was important not just because of that, but actually it was worth the prize. The Marcher Lords had quite amazing, staggering powers. I mentioned right at the start that within each Marcher Lordship, the Lord ruled as a, almost with a regal powers uh, of castle building, raising armies and waging war. Importantly, ministering their own justice and, and therefore the fines levied by the courts coming into their own pockets. So just in conclusion, thinking about it, why did that conquest? The Normans conquered England through one battle and then a period of four or five years to pacify the country. And yet the conquest of Wales took 200 years. Partly because the marcher lords themselves did not have the resources to sustain the conquest in the upland areas and therefore were always vulnerable to Welsh revival. And as I have shown, the priorities of the English crown for much of that period lay elsewhere. And it was only when the circumstances changed and the English crown became a priority for them as well to conquer Wales that it happened. The Mortimers, though, uh, emerged from the cauldron of that and as one historian has commented, that to have survived for over three centuries as marcher lords was a political and biological feat. And it was the survival of that, from that cauldron and emerging from it in a dominant position that uh, Andrew will be, after the break, will be talking about how they then begin to emerge as a power within England. Thank you.